See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so mild was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh my God. 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hear the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfil the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup? that the Father has given them. So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest of that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter, and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples, 
and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples, are you? Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see in the garden with you? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what are you bringing against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I was a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from him. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, no, Not no. this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Who is the son? Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, you ought to die, because he is willing to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. 
he entered his headquarters again and asked the Jews, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, If you refuse to speak to me, do not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you. Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it has been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, we are not afraid of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then, he handed them over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but this man says, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now, the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it and cast lots for it to see if you will get it. This was to fulfil what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on the vinegar, on the branch of hyssop, and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. 
So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with them. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had come to, first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby. They laid Jesus there. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Seeing a dead body is usually, for good or bad, a transformative experience. The first time I saw a dead body, it was actually, strangely, a positive experience. I went to see my 85 year old granddad as his body lay in the chapel of rest. <clears throat> he looked peaceful, and I found it extremely comforting to know that he wasn't actually there anymore. He was at rest, and his soul was at rest too. And I felt exactly the same when I visited my dad's body in the chapel of rest the night before his funeral. But not everyone's experience of visiting a loved one's body is as positive as for some people, it can be awful. Whilst I knew my granddad and then later my dad were at rest, what struck me later when reflecting back was how looking at a dead body is a reminder that one day I too will die. It is almost a mirror showing you that you also have a vocation a calling to die at some point, somewhere, sometime. Good Friday today is partly about holding up a mirror to ourselves, a mirror reflecting the reality of death right back at us. Today we remember Christ's death on the cross and his body hanging there, dead. We are called to see him hanging on the cross and to somehow be spiritually transformed by the experience. For me, looking at the cross is not at all like seeing my granddad or dad 
in the chapel of rest. The cross, to put it bluntly, is a truly horrific scene. We remember today a young man, probably in his early 30s, suffering in the most awful of ways and dying the kind of death we all fear. When we look up at that cross there, we don't see a lovely, peaceful image of someone at peace at the end of a nice long life. Rather, we see a young man dead after being tortured. And unfortunately, Jesus isn't the only young person to die in such a painful way. Billions of young humans throughout history have had such deaths. And people are now dying in terrible ways out there in the world right now. Jesus' death is only one example of death. Seeing someone die, especially such as someone dying on a cross, is disturbing to say the least. Even in our society here in the United Kingdom, we see people die in horrid ways. The most difficult moment I know of my parents' lives was watching their daughter, my sister, die as the doctors tried to frantically keep her 10-month-old body alive with defibrillators, but to no avail. I'm sure my parents, and perhaps a number of people sitting here today, know exactly how Mary, Jesus' mother, was feeling when she beheld her son on the cross, crying out in agony. I say this not to make us all feel depressed or disturbed. I say this because I think sometimes we see the crucifixion of Jesus so often, depicted in churches such as this, hanging nicely around people's necks on necklaces, almost a fashion statement sometimes, screwed onto people's walls at home, that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ can sometimes become normalised or sanitised. We can take his death for granted. Perhaps our minds sanitise what we see when we look at the crucifixion, and many of us will look at it several times a day, because we can't truly comprehend the horror of the cross. But the painful death of a person must never be taken for granted or be, or be sanitized. And apologies if you want this at your funeral, but there's a popular poem going around at the moment, which is often read at funerals, that starts with, death is nothing at all. It does not count. What a load of rubbish. <laughs> death is something. Death does matter. The death of Christ, the death of a friend, relative, or loved one, can't just be swept under the carpet. We wouldn't have Good Friday if death were nothing at all. With all that in mind, I do have a question. Why was the death of Christ different? His death is just one example of death. When so many other people have died in similar ways, Jesus was by no means the only person ever to be crucified. Thousands of people were. But we solemnly and reverently remember his death to this day. And that fact alone, I believe, is evidence that there was something very special about his death. Christianity teaches that in some mysterious and wonderful way, God himself was in Jesus Christ. Christ was and is God's Son. We don't believe in or teach an aloof, distant, absent God who doesn't care a fig about us. 
We don't believe in a God who is willing to turn his face away in disgust from our suffering and our death. Rather, we teach that God, the creator of all things, loves us so much that he enters into our very own suffering and death in Christ, in one of the most horrific deaths imaginable. God doesn't say, oh, never mind, as a human you will suffer and die, you just need to get over it. On the contrary, God enters into our own suffering head on, right there by our, our side, right there with us. But don't think for one moment either that this is merely about God being patronising. He doesn't die so that he can say to us, don't worry all, I know exactly how you feel, like a good therapist on the couch. No. He dies with us so that he can defeat and lay death low itself. God lets Christ die on the cross, but he dies so that he can then take death by the throat and free us from death at the resurrection. We just heard in our dramatic telling of Christ's passion earlier, how he cried from the cross, it is finished. <clears throat> Some people have interpreted that as a cry of resignation or defeat a cry of giving up. The Greek for it is finished, tetelestai, has more of a tone of victory or triumph. It's a triumphant cry. Christ knows that at the moment of his death, a great victory over death has been wrought, because he knows what's going to happen next, the resurrection. All of us sitting here, unless they create some miracle drug, will follow Christ to death. We all hope and pray that we'll die more peace peacefully than him, but nevertheless die we will. But because his death was actually a victory, the door which opens to the resurrection, our hope and promise is that the same door of resurrection will be opened to us at our deaths. But even in Christ's own time, people down the ages and many people today will ask, but why would God want to die like us? Why is that necessary? Well, part of my personal answer to that difficult question would be, find me a more intense, a more personal, a more earthy and realistic way of God expressing his love for us than Christ on the cross, and I'll give up my vocation in the church tomorrow. I don't find an aloof, uncaring, unconcerned God convincing at all. What I find in the Christian faith, today on Good Friday, is a God who is willing to intervene and involve himself in human suffering and death. And not only to involve himself, but to overcome death and give us hope. Of course, God could click his divine fingers and get rid of suffering and death. But for reasons beyond our comprehension, he doesn't do that. I personally suspect it's because as well as there being suffering in the world, there's also a huge amount that's good and beautiful in creation as well. So today, we remember and recognize the abhorrent, appalling, gruesome nature of death. We recognise that death is something. But we give thanks that in dying, 
Christ destroys our death. And may Christ, the victor on the cross, reign in our hearts in this world and in the next. And I encourage you to come to our Easter vigil and Easter Sunday services at the weekend to find out the next stage of this story. Amen.
Jesus, Son of God. You loved us and sacrificed yourself for us. God of glory, that we have chosen everything and kept your name. May we be crucified to you, be set free from the narrow and subtle standards of the world, and experience the liberty of the children of God. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Therefore, we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service for bishops and other priests and deacons, and those whom they serve, for Christopher and Rosemary, our bishops, and for all the people of this diocese of Southwark, for all Christians in this place, for those preparing to be baptised, for those who are mocked or persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Father, in your mercy, hear our Let us pray for the nations of the world and for their leaders, for all those who will die in conflict to this day. We pray for Charles, our King, and the parliaments of this land. We pray for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Father, in your mercy. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the, the Jews, the first to hear his word, for greater understanding between Christians and Jews, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. We pray for work between all of the religions. We pray for faithful witness between all of the Christian churches and denominations. And we give you thanks for churches together in Carsholton here. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for those who do not believe in the gospel of Christ. For those who have not heard the message of salvation. For all who have lost faith for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him. That God will open their hearts and lead them to faith. Lord, our Father, in your mercy. Let us pray for all who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them, that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favourably on your whole church, that the wonderful and sacred mystery, and by, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation 
and lets the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin, even Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Standing at the foot of the cross, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Amen. Amen.
the hour your son gave himself to death. Hear the devout prayer of your people. As he is lifted high upon the cross, draw into his exalted life all who are reborn in the blood and water flowing from his side. Amen. Amen. 